Hello everyone and welcome to today's SANS webcast. Lessons from, from the front lines of AppSec, analysis of real world attacks from 2019 and best practices for dealing with them, sponsored by ThreadX. My name is Carol Auth of SANS and I will be moderating today's webcast. Today's featured speakers are Chris perez Junis, Chief Product Officer, and Will Woodson, Lead Security Engineer, both at ThreadX. If during the webcast you have any questions for our presenters, please enter them into the questions window located on the GoToWebinar interface at any time. Please note that this webcast is being recorded and a copy of the slides and recording of this webcast will be available for viewing later today and can be found on the SANS registration page. And with that, I'd like to hand the webcast over to Chris. Sounds good, Carol. So, hi everyone. Good morning or good afternoon, and I hope it is as nice of a day as it is here in uh, Colorado. So, my name is Chris Brasunis, and I'm part of the ThreadX team. As Carol mentioned, my role is the Chief Product Officer, and I'm fortunate to be joined by one of my teammates who I love working with. So, Will, how about you introduce yourself to the, to the audience? Uh, sure. Uh, so, I'm Will Woodson. Uh, I am a lead security engineer here at ThreadX. Uh, I work, I guess, in our security operations center uh, with our customers to find interesting and exciting attacks and events and, and help them, uh, I guess, mitigate those. Yeah. All right. So, over the next 45 minutes, we're going to be talking about attacks that we as ThreadX have observed in our customer base in 2019 over the first six months. And my hope is that by the end of this session, you will have a better awareness um, of the application threats that are out there. And additionally, I hope this information will enable you to identify those attacks that you want to prioritize this year for having detection and protection for. So now let's, talk, let's go through the agenda. First thing I'd like to talk about are the recent attack trends observed in the market um, overall and in general. And after that, we'll overview some automation attacks, you know, describing how they work as well as the motivations of these attackers. And last but not least, Will will go over a few real cyber attack case studies that our ThreadX Labs team has observed. And these are ones that we really have seen in the wild and in our, in our customer environments. And more broadly, he will also give you guidance as to how to protect your applications from those attacks. So let's get started with understanding the threat landscape. Annually, there are organizations that review and analyze security risks. And you see a lot of those different reports that come out. Verizon is one of them, and the Data Breach Investigation Report, that's a bit of a mouthful, or DBI, DBIR, is one of them that has a lot of credibility. It's a great read, and it's one I suggest you review as it provides quite a bit of detail about cyber attacks and also breaks down top attacks by industry vertical. So their latest report, I think, came out in April, and it shows that web attacks, you see here in figure 14, are the most successfully attacked area of the enterprise. The report here shows it's 60%, if not more, of actual breaches. So that's pretty high. The report also lists approaches that attackers who successfully committed these breaches leveraged. And number one on that list are stolen credentials. And you see that here in figure 14 at the top. And that percentage is in, is in over 60% of the cases that they, that they actually investigated on. It's interesting to also look at the top approaches in figure 13. Look at number three, a vulnerability exploit of an application um, represented 20% of those breaches. Number four, a brute force login attack uh, represented 10%. So most of the top approaches listed in the 2019 DBIR are ways applications are most commonly attacked. So a high fraction of those web attacks are from automated attackers or something we more commonly call bots 
or bad bots or malicious bots. A recently re released report, this one from Distill, profiles web application traffic, and it's across humans as well as bots, good ones and bad ones. The results are in the pie chart that you see here in this presentation on the right. And what the data shows is that 20% of all web apps traffic is consumed by automation that are attempting to do something bad and attack. And again, that's a lot. And it's important to note that the percentage of malicious bot traffic identified in this report is an average, and it's an average across all industry verticals. So there are some industry, industry verticals that may have a much higher percentage and some a little lower. And the report shows a couple that are around the 40% level, and that includes financial services as well as ticketing sites. 40% of your traffic being bad bots, that's a, that is, again, a pretty big number. This slide you see here, um, <clears throat> shows the web traffic profiled against all industry verticals. So bad bot traffic is in red, good bots are in green, and then yellow are those humans. And what you see is that the bad bot traffic amount is going to vary, and it's going to vary across industry verticals, with some being high, like financial, and some being a little lower, like airlines. And if you look at something like IT and services, you see an average of almost 35% of their traffic um, from attacking bots. So the point here is that most external web applications are now today likely face, are going to face some sort of attack in 2019. And I think it's valuable for you to understand the types of attacks that are most often seen so you can pr prioritize how best to protect yourselves from, from them. And that's the point of this webinar. So now I'd like to talk through some bad bot approaches so you can understand how they work and what in the world are their motivations. So all right, how do bad bots work? Well, they automate activities at layer seven and the application level, abusing actions that are normally performed by humans, by us. The picture on the right, I think is a pretty good pictorial description as bad box are trying to emulate human action. And so that's what you see that gear there on the left. What are what are some of those actions? Well, it could be something like filling out a form, such as a user registration. It could be a feedback form. It could be just trying to log in. And actions they also could automate includes, you know, website exploration and traversal. So to evade detection, these automations are generated from a variety of sources. Most often, they're represented by different hosts and a number of IP addresses. This also enables them to generate load, and that gives them the capability to try lots of different variations of an action, such as login, in a short amount of time. And now, with the advent of public cloud, creating these types of automations is way, way easier, as the resources are frankly easy to acquire and pretty cheap. These sources are also can be ephemeral as they spin up and down, making it pretty damn hard to find and discover. And we'll talk about other ways to evade detection later in this presentation, as it's as it I believe it's in one of Will's use cases. And it is. So, and because of all this, traditional AppSec security tools, which do not have the ability to correlate multiple IPs to the same attacker, will typically not be able to contain a bad bot attack. So there are a number of reasons attackers leverage automation. First, they may be looking to acquire information on a website. Maybe they're looking for pricing information or competitive info. And this type of attack frequently occurs with online retailers. It also occurs with hotels and travel sites. It's an easy way in an online retail case to price match, right? If you ever wonder why some items on an e-commerce site don't provide a price until it's in a cart, well, it's to evade that scraping bot. Another motivator of a bad bot is to acquire inventory of a scarce resource that later the attacker may resell on a secondary market. 
So what are, what are examples? Well, movie tickets, concerts, sporting event tickets are great examples of this type of attack. <clears throat> Bad bots are also used to commit fraud. And that's leveraging stolen credit cards to purchase something. Or maybe they're trying to steal loyalty points from a retailer or hotel site and travel site. Bots may also look to exploit vulnerabilities of a website so that they can eventually acquire valuable data, such as personally identified information or PII. And this type of attack occurs in, unfortunately, pretty much every industry vertical. And last, automations can be used to influence public perception by creating fake reviews of a product or an event. They can also generate a large number of votes to influence who wins a contest. So if you have a site with reviews and or votes, ask yourself this question. How do you know if all those reviews and votes come from the input of real people? So that's a pretty scary thought. So in summary, there are lots of different reasons these types of cyber attacks occur in industry today. And many are pretty scary, at, at least in my opinion, as they can have dramatic impact on businesses. So I'm going to move on and next describe some of the approaches used in these attacks along with their common targets. Distributed password attacks are also known as brute force attacks, and these occur quite a bit, as you will hear more from Will. Here, a bot will try to break into an account that has high value, which could be just a user account, but it also could be an admin account. And they run through many user name password combinations with the goal of trying to get one to be successful. And if, they, if they're successful one, two percent of the time, that's pretty good for them, and they're happy. So to avoid blocking, they simply coordinate the attack across a large number of hosts. So what's the motivation? Well, targets of the attacks are logins that may have something valuable behind them, such as the ability to purchase an item, maybe there's some PII information, or maybe there's an ability to influence public opinion through commentary that comes from a hijacked account. Many of you have likely heard of this attack type, credential stuffing. It's been in the news here in 2019 quite a bit, as there's been, unfortunately, a large number of successful cases of this attack. And I'm not going to mention some of the enterprises, as I really don't want to call any one specific enterprise out, but it's a, it, it happens to be an unfortunate situation of our industry. And it's a specific type of distributed password attack where a bot leverages user password combinations acquired from a previous data breach where data and credentials were obtained. Lists of this information, as most of you probably know who are listening to this webcast, are easily accessible from the net today. And with these lists, bots try to use these combinations across a wide, wide range of websites with the goal of seeing which credentials are valid on which websites. So from there, fraud can be committed, such as making a purchase, stealing information, or impersonating a user for the purposes of some sort of um, influence. And the attacker could also be trying to sell these validated credentials on the dark web. So a validated stolen identity to a website is real currency, which has decent value on the dark web, something around $10. So now let's talk about a different type of attack, and this one's called fake account creation. So in this scenario, an automation creates a bunch of new accounts. So they go to a website, they look for that registration form, and they auto-fill it out. And those accounts are then used, more often than not, to do something not so great or something bad. An example is, try is tying up inventory for a retail site by placing it in a cart that never gets purchased. These accounts also can get used to co commit comment or voting fraud. So often this type of attack is done over a period of time, and we call it low and slow. 
So it makes this type of attack a little bit harder to detect through anomalous traffic behavioral monitoring, particularly when the bot is clever. And on this slide, you see some of the common targets um, that fake account creation is used. So again, used on uh, quite a number of different types of websites today. The last type of attack I'm gonna talk about is carding. Attackers in this case acquire credit card numbers or gift card IDs through the black market. They then take those IDs and validate them on retail sites. And they validate it with some smaller purchase that may fly under the radar of even, you know, of people who may have owned those cards previously. <clears throat> so attackers, you know, so what they do with these things is, or let me talk about why they're, why they're used and why they go about this. The reason is the fact that validated cards are worth more on the dark web, and thus it's a way for an attacker to make a little money. You know, with some easy automation, they can make some bucks. How much? Well, maybe about $30 for a valid card. Sites where carding occurs is often in the retail vertical. Unfortunately, though, you know, other websites, such as ones that have good purpose, such as fundraising and donations, they also get hit. So the moral of the story I have for you is if you have a site and it has some sort of purchasing capability, it has, unfortunately, the risk of carding. Now, I'm going to turn things over to Will, who's going to talk about the attacks we as ThreatX have observed in 2019. So, Will, are you ready to take it away? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, yeah, as, as Chris said, uh, we're going to go through a few examples uh, to illustrate each of the different types of attack that uh, Chris has described. Um, and these are all real-world attacks, uh, things that we've seen hit our customers over the really the first half of, of this year. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and talk through each case, um, kind of what we saw, the solution that we were able to provide for the customer uh, to stop the attack, and then a few suggestions for mitigating each attack that you might want to consider using um, in, in your own systems. So our first case is a distributed password attack. Um, so this was a password guessing attack. Um, we saw a, a botnet trying to log into our customer's admin portal. So the customer question, uh, they're a digital graphics company that have several brands, several web stores, and each of these include an admin portal so, you know, they can log in, uh, go and manage, update inventory, so on. So we saw a large number of failed logins to the administrative page, and that, that alerted our, um, our security engineering team to the issue. Uh, and we quickly saw that all of these failed login attempts were coming from a, a group of Ukrainian IP addresses. Uh, each IP address was sending a few authentication attempts, but all of them were targeting known admin accounts of, of this customer. And they were splitting up between each one of those different bot IPs, um, at, I guess different logins over time. So that resulted in keeping the individual login rate very low, and the botnet was able to, was able to evade some, some basic rate limits um, that we had in place. So the solution that we provided um, well, our WAF was automatically able to detect the spike in overall number of authentication failures to this administrative page and was able to start tracking each of the offending bots over time. The commonality was the, the geolocation that these were all sitting in Ukraine. And that's, well, for this particular customer, um, was, was very unusual. They don't do any business there. It's not a place that's necessarily known for having the best internet traffic in the first place. And uh, they definitely don't have any business operations or staff that are located in that country. So that really distinguishes that tra traffic from other logins to any of their pages, but especially admin pages. So we were able to block threat based on a combination of the geolocation um, of the, I guess, source IP addresses of, of each bot that we saw, as well as the behavior, the failed login attempts. This is a pretty safe compromise, uh, and it didn't really, or a safe pro compromise which would not prevent anyone from an otherwise unusual lo location um, from being able to browse the web store, hit, you know, see all the products on the pages and, and all, do all of that, but it would prevent the, the higher risk login attempts and, uh, you know, attempts to get into the, the admin portal from those more un unusual locations. 
So for best practices uh, that we'd, I guess, like to recommend coming out of here, um, the first is, and I, I cannot stress this enough, um, adding multi-factor authentication uh, to, well, really to all the things, but especially to administrative login pages, admin portals, anywhere where I guess you both have um, a higher risk of a single account being compromised and, and that presenting a lot of risk to your organization. Uh, and where they're being used by a limited audience and potentially a limited audience that you have the, the capability to, um, I guess, in, enforce using multi-factor authentication for. Um, MFA works like very, very well against bot attacks like this. It's basically 100% effective against basic bots and, and automation, and that's a, according to research that uh, Google uh, published a couple weeks ago. Hmm. Um, it, it really does stop things pretty much outright uh, when you can use it. The second uh, best practice we've identified is if you can't do MFA or in addition to doing MFA, um, is detecting or you know, alerting, uh, being able to detect or alert on patterns in login failures. So that's, it's really your uh, fraudulent login detection, whether that's with a, a WAF, whether that's in your application itself, whether you're logging that off somewhere and doing correlation in a logging engine or, or a SEM type tool, if you want to be able to know when something isn't right and ideally be able to mitigate that um, immediately or in, in very close to real time by either blocking out right, by throwing a CAPTCHA and challenging the um, offending, I guess, client login, uh, or simply by just tar pitting it, slowing it down um, while, while someone goes to take more active mitigation. The last best practice we identified was, uh, I guess, adding dynamic protections to your application. And by the dynamic protections, we really mean um, going beyond just uh, an IP address. You can you know, blacklist an IP address or block an IP because of a myriad of reasons. Uh, but if you're only doing it you know, and leaving that identifier in blocked forever, you're going to end up blocking legitimate traffic. As, as Chris had said earlier, a lot of this stuff comes from, uh, I guess, public cloud providers. And public, cloud, public cloud providers, sorry, <laughs> um, definitely rotate out IP addresses over time. So blocking not only the you know, IP address, but also characteristics like the browser, the capabilities of that browser, the location, and then you know the actual behavior that they are, are carrying out at the application le level that is malicious gives you a, a lot more power than, than just going and blacklisting an IP once you've seen it uh, do something malicious. All right, go to the next one? Yep, next one. Okay, so case number two. Um, this is credential stuffing. So we saw a, uh, a credential stuffing attack being performed against one of our customers. This was a, a large online retailer. Um, it was being performed by a moderately sized botnet, somewhere around five to 10,000 IP addresses uh, that were, were sending various credentials uh, to their customer login uh, slash account login page. Um, they were failing to authenticate pretty much every time, but as we said, the, the fit success rate on these is, is very, very low, but it doesn't matter because you only need a couple to, for it to be worth your time. Um, so this was quite similar to the, I guess, credential or the, the login brute force attack that we saw previously, um, in that the login attempts were split up among a very large number of bots. We saw more bots in this case, but it's still pretty similar, uh, I guess, from, from our perspective. Uh, and uh, again, because this was uh, split up and it was uh, such a low rate from each individual um, bot IP address, it was mostly able to stay on, under the radar of, of your basic level protections. So to the solution that we were able to provide, um, our WAF was able to detect an elevated rate of login failures to the retailer site, uh, but this alone wasn't enough. Um, we also, uh, I guess, were able to track the number of distinct usernames sent by each one of those bot IP addresses um, that, that had attempted to log in and then the number of successful logins from each. And the kind of formula that we were able to work out from that was, well, if you have tried multiple usernames and you've had multiple failures and you haven't had any successes or if you had a very low number of successes over any period of time, you know, again, it's, it's a low rate, a, a 
probably like 10 to 15 an hour from a single IP, um, then you're most likely part of this credential stuffing attack. So the number of distinct usernames attempted, you know, plus the failure rate and was really enough for us to be able to uh, put in, I guess, a custom mitigation for this, this particular customer um, that ended up uh, allowing us to confidently block only the, the bot IP addresses that were exhibiting this credential stuffing behavior while still allowing perfectly legitimate users to, to log in. So, for best practices that we identified for this, credential stuffing at least, um, first is to, to monitor your login forms in aggregate. Uh, this is, you know, it can be as simple as picking a few metrics, you know, total logins, uh, the percentage of failed logins over time, unique usernames attempted over time. Uh, these can, can quickly help show when a credential stuffing attack has started or is underway that, well, that something's going on. <laughs> Now, ideally, um, the, the, this monitoring can tip off your actual active controls to start challenging or blocking the, the higher risk attempts, where higher risk is defined as any uh, client that uh, exhibits, uh, I guess, attributes that look like a bot or behavior that looks like a bot. Um, and then last, if, if possible, and this is reiterating what we said in the, the last slide, um, if you can incentivize it and, and make it relatively easy to set up, uh, consider implementing, implementing MFA for your uh, customer login accounts as well. Um, so, yeah, I think we can move on to the next one. All right, sounds good. Cool. So case number three. Um, yeah, next we're going to talk about a, a slightly different type of bot attack. Uh, the previous two were based on authentication. Um, this does have a authentication component, but uh, the, I guess, impetus for the attack or the kind of purpose of the attack was, uh, I guess, automated credit card proofing or carding. So another one of our customers uh, runs uh, several sports media sites uh, that include a, a paid subscription component. So when you sign up uh, for this, I guess, sign up, create a new account, you are given the option to, uh, I guess, get a subscription to the site at the same time and provide your credit card data and so on. So the customer saw an, an elevated rate of new account registrations that included payment card information. Uh, well, why? Well, as uh, we, we learned about carding earlier, uh, bouncing these compromised credit card numbers uh, in large volume against an online car, card authorization flow uh, can be used to confirm that they're still useful. It's a step part of the chain of selling these and can um, eventually lead to using them in um, I guess larger fraudulent transactions. Um, and then this isn't necessarily just for, for credit cards, but it can be used for gift cards, loyalty numbers, so on. Um, but, but this was cards. So the solution we able, were able to provide uh, to this customer, um, well, we were first able to profile the application sign-up workflow. Uh, so there's there are multiple steps, multiple screens. The actual credit card transaction, um, in this case, was not flowing through us, which um, is, is good and bad. Uh, but we're able to determine which form was being targeted and then use our uh, existing analytics being collected for that form to identify the, the bot network that was uh, responsible for, for registering a, a large volume of these fraudulent accounts. Uh, so the bot that was used in the attack uh, included some interesting kind of distinguishing characteristics. Uh, namely, it had a, an uncommon set of request headers, the uh, the user agent, the language preferences, uh, those other uh, attributes about the browser that are sent out that kind of in in summation or in some were were not, uh, didn't look like a, a typical browser in some ways, um, as well as the geolocation and, and then the behavioral patterns. The flow through the signup um, that we saw for this set of bots was unusual compared to a, a regular user. So we were able to uh, block the bot nodes based on these characteristics. Um, and then we're additionally, beyond just blocking the immediate issue, uh, we're able to target and then add additional challenges for other suspicious looking signups in the future that had similar characteristics. The best practice we were able to identify for carding here are first to, to validate user accounts and, and email addresses during the registration flow. Um, if possible, doing this before actually taking any card data uh, really helps reduce the number of 
fraudulent card transactions you might try to process. And then to uh, profile important workflows. So that's your, your sign-up workflows, your checkouts, your um, well, administrative logins, of course. Uh, but I guess tracking when progression through each of these, um, these different workflows uh, falls outside of the, the expected pattern. If typically you go to A to B to C, um, going straight to B and then to C without going to A is, is definitely unusual from just a, a basic behavioral pattern. So if I understand correctly, you know, the first best practice is something that the app dev guys can implement, right? Yes, absolutely. That is very likely something that is going to be implemented on the development side. Right. But if we can't control what's going on the app dev side, then the second one is something the security guys, security team can implement. Yep. Yep, that is true. It is something that can be implemented either, I guess, uh, all, all of these controls are something that can be implemented um, I guess as part of development of the application or continue maintenance of the application, or if, if that isn't an option or if it's quicker in some cases, it can be implemented through a, uh, a layer on top of that. Right, or in the same token, there's defense, there's a there's a theory that has, let's do, um, let's have defense in depth. So Absolutely. do both. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one. Are you ready? Yep. Okay, so this is our last, um, our last case that we're gonna go over here. It's uh, for uh, content scraping and uh, innovation. So it really combines both, um, yeah, I guess a content scraping component, a you know, content harvesting, just be able to pull things off of our one of our customers' websites or several of our customers' websites with uh, an innovation component. Um, so we getting into it, uh, we observed this across a, a number of our customers earlier this year, but we saw a, um, I guess, a, a network of, of bots using uh, a number of anonymous proxies to, I guess, amplify uh, the, the number of IP addresses available uh, for, for their network and split up their uh, content scraping across a, a very large network of, of I guess, IP addresses or, or hosts. Uh, so the most significant target of this content scraping uh, was a major enterprise service provider. Uh, they host multiple large sites for um, I guess product support and knowledge bases, uh, types of sites that have a, a lot of potentially valuable content on them uh, for, for scraping. Uh, we initially detected a spike in what looked like uh, proxy traffic across their sites. Uh, you know, this isn't really that uncommon. We see anonymous proxies are, are often used by attackers to obfuscate their true origin. Um, and, but the, the volume of this particular case was, um, was a lot higher than we typically see. Um, I, I also had to put a note in that um, obfuscating traffic or anonymizing traffic is not 100% going to be used for nefarious purposes. There are some legitimate cases, but it, it definitely um, is an, an indicator you still probably want to track um, off the bat. Do you want to track as part of maybe identifying risk associated with that user or that session? Right. It, it's definitely a characteristic of that session that you you might want to to classify as carrying some level of risk, but it, it might not be something you want to just block out right um, with, without looking into it any further. Um, so, uh, as, as I mentioned a uh, second ago, the volume of proxy traffic that we saw in this case was large enough that we wanted to dig a little bit further into it. Um, so we were able, after a, a little bit of investigation, to determine the, the high volume of proxy traffic was, in fact, a coordinated effort to bulk scrape content from, um, in this case, this particular customer site, and that it was a, a single bot or a, a collection of bots uh, coordinated working together that were um, executing this through this network of proxies. So the solution that we were able to put in place, um, our WAF was, I guess, able to automatically begin tracking this proxy traffic um, you know, with that additional analysis, we were able to distinguish it from uh, legitimate user traffic, um, you know, content scraping, especially when, when split up uh, throughout an entire network, is uh, a little bit challenging to be able to distinguish from what looks like normal user browsing through your site. But there definitely are some characteristics that are, are different. Um, and then using these characteristics and tracking I guess both the again like the attributes of those those requests as well as the bot like behavior of 
scanning and scraping through each of those sites. We were able to, to end up blocking the attack without disrupting any of the requests from, I guess, your, your valid aggregators, or as we saw in earlier slides, uh, good bots, um, authorized SEO tools, and, and so on. And that brings us to our last set of best practices. So for guess, mitigation con mitigating content scraping and uh, evasion, uh, we, we definitely would suggest considering uh, blocking anonymous proxy servers, uh, services like Tor. Um, I mean, as I said, not all traffic from these is going to be malicious, but a large portion that you see uh, probably is. Um, the second is to treat anonymized traffic um, itself really as, as somewhat higher risk. You know, have some kind of way to classify that traffic and kind of separately and say, maybe I want to include additional authentication or in interrogation challenges uh, for traffic that I, I know is trying to anonymize itself. Um, and then last is to profile uh, user characteristics uh, and kind of what user behavior looks like on a site to distinguish that between um, legitimate users and, and automated traffic. This allows you to selectively and Generally, it'll be temporary because you, you don't want to block, you know, an IP forever. Um, but at least temporarily block the automated traffic that um, you can determine does present a risk itself. And I think that's that's the end of our, our use cases. So I'll hand it back to you, Chris. All right. Well, thanks, Bill. I think those were pretty, uh, pretty cool uh, use cases. And I hope that this has helped our audience here um, understand the type of attacks should be thinking about here in 2019. So I'm going to end it with some takeaways for all you. So first, when you're when reviewing your security controls for websites, and also think about doing it for APIs as well. Make sure those solutions have ways to detect bad bots that can attack from multiple different sources and IPs. So second. Leverage profiling, and that's something that Will talked about a lot, to help surface fraudulent or, you know, suspiciously bad activity. So that includes profiling the applications frequently. First of all, because they change. And then second, as they change, you want to understand its vulnerabilities as well as its normal use. We also recommend profiling every user of a site from the mindset, though, of an attacker. And that user could be one that is coming from a single source or it could be coming from multiple. So there are behaviors and actions that could suggest that a user is an attacker. Just because they are using an anonymizer, as Will suggested, doesn't mean they're an attacker, but it's something to take into account. And then if that user does something else that behaviorally looks suspicious, then maybe when you have two or three of those different types of behaviors, then you can classify that as an attacker and do something to at least protect your application from that for a period of time. And last, make sure your security solutions can in real time look for malicious automation activities so that mitigations can be put in place and put in place automatically without requiring human intervention or security personnel because that just takes more time and that's more time that attacker has to do something bad. So if you want to hear more on this topic, then here's a consideration for you. Join our live demo, and it's later this week on Thursday, June 6th. We'll send you an info on how to join it. So thanks, everyone, for your time um, listening to this webinar. And Carol, I'll, I'll send it back to you. All right, thanks for that great presentation. We have some questions ready for the Q&A. However, if anyone has a question for our presenters, please enter it into the questions window now. Our first one came in quite a while ago. Uh, he asks, what are good bots? What do they do? And what are they used for? Sure, so we, uh, we, we typically consider good bots to be, uh, They'll be your search engine crawlers. They'll be authorized SEO tools. They'll be things that um, you, you want to be able to get to your site uh, for uh, search engine placement or for uh, site profiling types of purposes. Yeah, and I can add to that. You know, typically your marketing teams are going to know all about those good bots. 
because it's your marketing teams who want to make sure that um, that when when a specific, ah, specific keyword is referenced, that your enterprise is is one of the top of the list to to uh, to be in those search results. And part of doing that is letting those search crawlers run effectively. Another um, good bot could be testing in such a way. So you need to be careful also is that, you know, there is pen trust, there is testing that could be going on and you need to also be aware of, of, of when a website is being tested. Now you may want it to make sure it's blocked or you want, or you may want to make sure that, that, that it's not, that it's not going to block those things. So also be aware of the user agents that are out there that are, that are, and also the period of time that your enterprises are doing some of that testing and make a decision as to what you want to do in terms of that setup. Right. We definitely see, um, I guess, authorized uh, penetration testing in some cases that we've been asked to allow through so you can test the, the application behind the web. That's right. Um, and then we definitely see, I guess, uh, application profiling and uh, more, uh, I guess, engineering-focused testing tools that are looking at performance of the application and, and um, validating that things can go into production. All right. Thank you both. What is the time span that you typically use for temporarily blocking an IP? Want to answer that, Will? Yeah. Um, so uh, by default, right now, we typically, once we've uh, determined that an IP address is is malicious enough, uh, we'll block that by, uh, I guess, for about 30 minutes, a 30-minute time period. Um, that can escalate or be shorter. Uh, kind of a combination of uh, our user preference and also on um, number of occurrences. So if a single IP address has been blocked, you know, we, we do keep a history on it and that can get progressively longer. Right. And then if, and then if, uh, and if the, the, the user um, stops doing some attacking, we may eventually after that period, period, period of time may release it, but then still monitor what we call watch that yep. user, right? Yep, things definitely are, um, I guess, go from a, a blocked state where we're, we're still doing some tracking, but um, the traffic is, is blocked, to, um, to being watched again uh, very, very frequently. Um, even things that have been blocked for uh, a, a number of times and have been blocked for an extended period of time will age out of that and you know, based on certain characteristics, certain well, not being active. All right, thank you. What are the ballot aggregators mentioned in the content scraping and evasion example? Sure. So in this case, um, the, the ag aggregators that we have in mind are primarily going to be your, your search engine spiders. So Googlebot, um, I guess uh, e even Yandexbot uh, <laughs> from Russia. Um, but those bots that are, I guess, we have a capability very easily to validate and say, you you say that you are this, we can check that you are not lying about who you are. Um, we don't want to affect SEO or, I guess, search positioning of these these knowledge base type sites. Um, so those those are the ones uh, that we specifically have in mind, um, talking about valid aggregators. All right, thank you. What's the impact of an attacker scraping your site? Sites are scraped all the time. What is wrong with your site being scraped? Well, I can talk to that one. I mean, one of the main, major reasons for you don't want a, a site to be scraped is because you don't want information that is on that site that, you're, that you're, you are leveraging for your business, like pricing, retail pricing. And uh, if you're if you've got something if you got a great sale and you're trying to clear inventory for a retail trying to clear clear inventory last thing you want is a scraping bot trying to take that information and and then all of a sudden try to try to one up you or go lower and then on on some other and then when you look at search engines they you know that site comes out first so typically it's it's to avoid um, scraping of of data that can influence and impact negatively. The business that you're trying to run, and and so in retail pricing is is a is a good example of that um, that I have. All right, thank you. What about using some JavaScript calculations within a page? 
Is it assumed that the attacker will also implement JavaScript? Usually they are using scripted web page collection. Right. So we, we definitely do see some, uh, I guess, bots that are uh, more sophisticated and are using uh, JavaScript. They're implementing a, uh, a headless browser or something that is running that entire engine and can execute it. Um, so, so that is a, a possibility. We do have, um, I guess, here at ThreadX at least, some mitigations for that and ways to detect that. Uh, but we also see, especially in the um, content scraping side where you're, you're really just grabbing all kinds of content that those tend to be a little bit, um, for lack of a better word, dumber um, and are, are less likely to, to load JavaScript, which makes it easy. You can say, well, I don't, if if you look suspicious in some way and I challenge you with some uh, snippet of JavaScript and you won't run it, then um, I've got a pretty high likelihood that, that you are uh, a, a bot that I might not want. All right, thank you. What is the best way to detect failed logins? Somehow build into the API or login file watching or syslog? Yeah, so it definitely depends very much on your application. Um, in some cases, we do see applications that return with a, a 401 unauthorized uh, on a failed login. That makes it really easy to for us to be able to profile it and say a good login looks like a 200, bad login looks like an HTTP 401 error. Um, there are obviously other cases uh, where we sitting out in front of the web application as a proxy can uh, inspect the response content and see the difference between success and failure uh, and, and see the change in the behavior. Um, on the application side, uh, I can't necessarily speak to an individual application, but you definitely have the capability to log separately whether things are successful or, or failed. Yeah, in that case, I think the question reference syslog, and certainly, you know, monitoring your logging information off your applications is a good idea. And that way you can monitor that, that login rate. If the application is indeed um, recording every every failure every or in, and every success, let's say, then you can use something like a, a log management solution. You can Maybe you can use your SEM to, to, to be able to detect some of that stuff and then respond. All right, thanks. Uh, do you believe that the bad bots are living in the actual data centers and those data centers need to be sanitized? <laughs> Actually, I'm going to take a, I'm going to guess, first of all, um, could they be in the in the data centers? Well, yes. We legacy infrastructure, um, especially legacy infrastructure that is running um, older operating systems, um, because and it could be for good reason. It could be it could be very difficult to upgrade. Could be susceptible to getting attacked through some malware that then attaches themselves um, as as bots inside inside of that data center. So certainly, um, you probably do want to make sure that you're you're reviewing your servers and your endpoints to to make sure those those that that infrastructure is clean. At the same time, today. I think there's an easier way, and the easier way is, frankly, just use the cloud. And what we'll talk about is then you can you can use anonymizers, use the cloud, and and your servers now are ephemeral. They come up and they spin up and they spin down, and so it's it's pretty easy um, to to create an attack of a large number of nodes. Do you have anything to add to this? Yeah, I mean, I'll I'll say that as far as um, I guess trying to locate the specific locations where these bad bots are going to come from is, uh, I guess, can be a big challenge. Um, there are certain network neighborhoods, right, certain public IP address ranges that are owned by ISPs who are going to be a little bit less uh, scrupulous about who they allow to use it um, that are maybe an easier decision. Uh, but there are plenty, including your public cloud providers, that will pretty much rent out um, IP address space to anyone, um, at least under certain conditions for a certain period of time. Um, and you you are very unlikely to be able to, uh, I guess, blacklist or, or make any strong decisions solely based on their, um, their location, um, whether that's geolocation, network location, in the same, um, I guess, close to where you have deployed your server or far away. All right, thank you. Uh, does your solution eliminate the need for CAPTCHA? 
customers really hate them and it would be nice to implement a better solution. Yeah, so um, we hear you. Um, so Will, what you know? Do you have some data around the, the success of CAPTCHA? Uh, yeah, well, I don't. I don't have nice numbers off the top of my head. Um, I I definitely have seen plenty of, I guess, research and uh, examples of how CAPTCHA can be defeated quite easily. Um, so, if CAPTCHA is is not all that effective against bots, especially more sophisticated bots. Um, and it also upsets people, uh, humans, to try to use, then it, it isn't necessarily the most effective solution. Um, there are definitely cases where you still might want to, uh, I guess, add enhanced interrogation and optionally add a, a CAPTCHA. But for every login, that's definitely um, gets gets frustrating. Yeah, and I, I think, you know, now speaking from a ThreadX perspective, we don't recommend it. Um, we will, we, we, you know, if customers do want it, we understand, but in general, we, we think there are better solutions to yield a stronger true, true positive and a better user experience. And there is uh, invisible CAPTCHA as well as reCAPTCHA, and, and that also has, you know, similar, you know, mild success rate that there is. But um, it, it does have some success. So my, my point here is you can use it. I would... But if you want a better user experience, look for a better solution. And I'll, I'll tack on um, one more, I guess, to the specific, it, can, can we eliminate that type of thing? Um, we do have the capability to, I guess, using uh, more, I guess, behavior profiling slash behavior analysis of, I guess, each individual session, have the capability to uh, do a lot of anti-bot detection or um, labeling things as potentially bots uh, that allows us to to reduce the need for CAPTCHA. All right, thanks. So this next question is rather long, so I assigned it to you guys in the chat window. You might, or, I'm sorry, the questions window. You might want to expand that so you can take a look as well. Um, for the credential stuffing attack that was using over 5,000 plus nodes, what did you learn about those nodes? Were they infected user computers? Were they from the same or dispersed locations? Were they using a common ISP pre, pre, excuse me, a common ISP provider? If so, was the ISP provider notified? If the computers were infected by something and made part of a botnet, were you able to determine how the infection or infections occurred? And I'm happy to repeat it if you'd like. Uh, sure, uh, that, that, that shouldn't be necessary. I, I think I've, I've got it, or uh, the gist of it at least. Um, so for that particular case, uh, we um, really were not able to, to track that down to a single ISP or single provider. Um, these were geographically dispersed, I guess, across a lot of different locations, over a lot of uh, different ISPs. Uh, so we ended up using, um, I guess, in our case, we were profiling the individual behavior of each one of those bots that was involved, um, as opposed to trying to make any, any decisions based on the, the ISP or, or network um, kind of locations of, of involved bots. So I, I guess uh, as far as classifying whether or communicating with that ISP um, or set of ISPs or knowing anything specific about the, the potential malware or the fact that these were just uh, potentially compromised servers, uh, that analysis uh, we did not go into. We, we protected our customer and set of customers. Yeah, but one of the things I do believe you guys did, um, Will, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is that I believe you guys did try to contact some of those ISPs and let them know there's is something suspicious here. I mean, so, so we're trying to do the right thing, right? Mm -hmm. So so actually there is, um, that is actually for a, one of our other cases that we brought up, the, um, the list of, I guess, scraping uh, proxy IP networks that we saw. We, in that case, actually did uh, communicate to each of the um, affected ISPs, uh, reached out to each of those providers. They abused contacts through um, through Aaron and through, uh, I guess, publicly available contacts. Uh, and in those cases, saw that even though we were able to track it down to an individual set of, of networks, um, that would, we didn't really get uh, too much of a response, right, unfortunately. All right, thank you. Uh, someone asks, uh, don't the cloud providers have their own monitoring to detect malicious use of their resources? Yes, of course. 
um, the effect, uh, I guess, efficacy of that, we, based on what we see, uh, I guess, hitting our, our customers, is is definitely not 100 percent, or definitely not 100 percent immediately. All right, thanks. And it looks like uh, someone's looking for some clarification. They say, so bot detection is your suggestion rather than the use of CAPTCHA? Yes, absolutely. CAPTCHA is, um, is first of all, you're going to get uh, false negatives. <clears throat> all right. Um, most, many bots, I would say 50% or more, I mean, we don't have the specific numbers, but it's pretty high, uh, will be able to avoid um, CAPTCHA. And in fact, if you go to the OWASP site, I believe it, I think there's a, a draft document that describes um, <clears throat> uh, CAPTCHA and its effectiveness, and it'll talk to that. So yes, there are, you do want to have some more sophisticated ways um, to be able to detect um, bot types of bot type of attacks, and that could be through, um, <clears throat> you know, uh, modern modern application security protection solutions, and of course, Threat Expert, one of those. Um, you can also look at, you know, specific bot protection solutions as well. And I think, I think Will, you found the exact name of that old WASP document. Uh, well, so what I actually brought up um, oh. is a, a document published by the W3C, uh, that the was it. inaccessibility of CAPTCHA. Um, it might be a different do document than you're, you were thinking of. It. Um, yeah. But as far as going into some of the issues with CAPTCHA, uh, as far as both usability for people and its, uh, I guess, overall lack of, of efficacy, um, there, there are definitely a number of, of bot protection solutions, including the one that we provide, that uh, we, we definitely see or as certainly feel um, has a, a higher true positive rate and a lower false negative rate. Yep. All right, uh, we've got some feedback. They said, great stuff. Thanks a bunch for answering my questions. This is very helpful information. All right, well, that's what we're <laughs> aiming to do, hoping to be helpful. <laughs> All right, great. So this next question is also a long one, so I, I put this one in the questions window as well. Uh, they ask, or they say, when you talk about the potential to replace CAPTCHA, you mention a comprehensive behavior analysis. How much of this behavior analysis is automated in your system and how much requires customization? Uh, for example, if you're able to put the ThreadX system in front of the web server, is it quicker or less expensive to implement these controls because many are canned? Yeah, so so uh, I guess uh, to answer the, the end of that, is it, is it quicker or less expensive because many are canned? Yes. Um, we do have a number of, I guess, um, Without getting too too far into the details, we do have a number of prototypes, basically, of of rules that we can use to um, to start capturing and profiling uh, login forms, um, checkout forms, places where you're uh, going to have higher risk, right, of uh, a higher risk transaction being um, executed. Uh, to so yeah. uh, you know, I, let me let me keep going on that. And you know, what we do is that we're looking for different succinct behaviors that are suspicious. And then what we do is that we add up, when, when the number of different suspicious behaviors occur over a period of time, and that period of time can be tens of tens of minutes, it can be an hour. Um, then what we do is we elevate risk and we say, you know what, this looks like um, a, a something of an attacker. Then we see something similar somewhere else, and through those similar characteristics, we can what we call um, join that other session with the original session that we labeled as suspicious, and then we say, you know what, that looks like a multiple IP or multiple host attack. And so that's how we automate some of these things. So as an example, just because you're behind an anonymizer, it doesn't mean that you're going to, we're just going to go ahead and naively block you. We're just going to say, you know what, that's risky behavior. And if you think about the approach that we use here, the approach we use here is very similar to what you see in the, in the MITRE attack uh, framework for endpoints, where they're looking for different types of behavior, and then you see a number of them over a period of time, and you say, you know what, there is something going on here. And that's, and that's effectively how we go about and, and, and are able to automatically uh, detect many of these situations. Now, that said, there are situations that um, we do need to, uh, our, we do have you know, experts who, who are monitoring these sites, and, and Will is one of them, who monitors these things and from a threat hunting perspective see something 
um, nefarious, and then we'll also uh, then um, perhaps take an action that then will, you know, because it, it sees something through threat hunting that also is a behavior that needs to be added to those things that were automatically detected in the detection of bots. So from the customer perspective, it's easier and it's cheaper because in all that I described, you didn't do anything. All right, well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much, Chris and Will, for your great presentation and to ThreadX for sponsoring this webcast, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For our schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again the next SANS webcast.